A Defensive Diamond by H. H. Monroe. Treadleford sat in an easeful armchair in front of a slumberous fire with a volume of verse in his hand and the comfortable consciousness that outside the club windows the rain was dripping and pattering with persistent purpose. The chill wet October afternoon was merging into a bleak wet October evening and the club's smoking room seemed warmer and cozier by contrast. It was an afternoon on which to be wafted away from one's climactic surroundings and the golden journey to Samarkand promised to bear Truddleford well and bravely into other lands and under other skies. He had already migrated from London, the rain swept at Baghdad the Beautiful, and stood by the sun gate in the olden time when an icy breath of imminent annoyance seemed to creep between the book and himself. Anvilcope, the man with the restless, prominent eyes and the mouth ready mobilized for conversational openings, had planted himself in a neighboring armchair. For a twelve-month and some odd weeks, Treadleford had skillfully avoided making the acquaintance of his voluble fellow clubmen. He had marvelously escaped from the infliction of his relentless record of tedious personal achievements, or alleged achievements, on golf links, turf, and gaming table by flood and field and covert side. Now his season of immunity was coming to an end. There was no escape. In another moment, he would be numbered among those who knew Amblecope to speak to, or rather, to suffer being spoken to. The intruder was armed with a copy of Country Life, not for purposes of reading, but as an aid to conversational icebreaking. Rather a good portrait of Throstlewing, he remarked explosively, turning his large, challenging eyes on Treadleford. Somehow it reminds me very much of Yellowstep, who was supposed to be such a good thing for the Grand Prix in 1903. Curious race that was, I suppose. I've seen every race for the Grand Prix for the last... Be kind enough never to mention the Grand Prix in my hearing, said Treadleford desperately. It awakens acutely distressing memories. I can't explain why without going to a long and complicated story. Oh, certainly, certainly, said Amblecope hastily. Long and complicated stories that were not told by himself were abominable in his eyes. He turned the pages of country life and became spuriously interested in the picture of Mongolian pheasant. Not a bad representation of the Mongolian variety, he exclaimed, holding it up for his neighbor's inspection. They do very well in some covers. Take some stopping, too, once they're fairly on the wing. I suppose the biggest bag I ever made in two successive days. My aunt, who owns the greater part of Lincolnshire, broke in Treadleford with dramatic abruptness, possesses perhaps the most remarkable record in the way of a pheasant bag that has ever been achieved. She is 75 and can't hit a thing, but she always goes out with the guns. When I say she can't hit a thing, I don't mean to say that she doesn't occasionally endanger the lives of her fellow guns because that wouldn't be true. In fact, the chief government, Whip, won't allow ministerial MPs to go out with her. We don't want to incur by-elections needlessly. We quite reasonably observed. Well, the other day, she winged a pheasant and brought it to the earth with a feather or two knocked out of it. It was a runner, and my aunt saw herself in danger of being done out about the only bird she'd hit during the present reign. Of course she wasn't going to stand that. She followed it through bracken and brushwood, and when it took to the open country and started across a plowed field, she jumped on it to the shooting pony and went after it. The chase was a long one, and when my aunt at last ran the bird to a standstill, she was near home than she was to the shooting party. She had left that some five miles behind her. Rather a long run for a wounded pheasant, snapped Amblecope. The story rests on my aunt's authority, said Trebleford coldly, and she is local vice president of the Young Women's Christian Association. She trotted three miles or so to her home, and it was not till the middle of the afternoon that it was discovered that the lunch for the entire shooting party was in the pannier attached to the pony's saddle. Anyway, she got the bird. Some birds, of course, take a lot of killings, said Amblecope. So do some fish. I remember once I was fishing in the X. Lovely trout stream, lots of fish, though they don't run to any great size. One of them did, announced Treadleford with emphasis. My uncle, the Bishop of South Moulton, came across a giant trout in a pool just off the main stream of the X near Ugworthy. He tried it with every kind of fly and worm every day for three weeks without an atom of success, and then fate intervened on his behalf. There was a low stone bridge just over this pool. 
and on the last day of the fishing holiday, a motor van ran violently into the parapet and turned completely over. No one was hurt, a part of the parapet was knocked away, and the entire load that the van was carrying was pitched over and fell a little way into the pool. In a couple minutes, the giant trout was flapping and twisting on bare mud at the bottom of a waterless pool. My uncle was able to walk down to him, fold him to his breast. The van load consisted of blotting paper and every drop of water in that pool had been sucked up into the mass of split cargo. There was a silence for nearly half a minute in the smoking room, and Treadleford began to let his mind steal back towards the golden road that led to Samarkand. Amblecope, however, rallied and remarked in a rather tired and dispirited voice. Talking of motor accidents, the nervous squeak I ever had the other day, motoring with old Tommy Yarby in North Wales. Awfully good sort, old Yarby. Thorough good sportsman, and the best. It was in North Wales, said Treadleford. That my sister met with her sensational carriage accident last year. She was on her way to a garden party at Lady Nivenez, and the only garden party that ever comes to pass in those parts in the course of the year, and therefore a thing that she would have been very sorry to miss. She was driving a young horse that she'd only bought a week or two previously, warranted it to be perfectly steady for motor traffic, bicycles, and other common objects on the roadside. The animal lived up to its reputation and passed the most explosive of motorbikes with an indifference that almost amounted to apathy. However, I suppose we all draw the line somewhere, and this particular cob drew it at traveling wild beast shows. Of course, my sister didn't know that, but she knew it very distinctly when she turned a sharp corner and found herself in a mixed company of camels, five old horses, and canary-colored vans. The dog cart was overturned in a ditch and kicked to splinters, and the cob went home across country. Neither my sister nor the groom was hurt. The problem of how to get to Niveneth Garden Party, some three miles distant, seemed rather difficult to solve. Once there, of course, my sister would easily find someone to drive her home. I suppose you wouldn't care for the loan of a couple of my camels, the showman suggested in a humorous sympathy. I would, said my sister, who had ridden camel back in Egypt, and she overruled the objections of the groom, who hadn't. She picked out two of the most presentable looking of the beasts and had them dusted and made as tidy as was possible at short notice and set out for Niven and Mansion. You may imagine the sensation that her small but imposing caravan created when she arrived at the hall door. The entire garden party flocked up to gape. My sister was rather glad to slip down from her camel and the groom was thankful to scramble down from his. When young Billy Dalton of the Dragoon Guards who has been at a lot of Aden and thinks he knows camel language backwards, thought he would show off by making the beast kneel down in orthodox fashion. Unfortunately, camel words of command are not the same all the world over. These were magnificent Turkestan camels, accustomed to stride up the stony terraces of mountain passes, and when Dalton shouted at them, they went side by side up the front steps into the entrance hall and up the grand staircase. The German governess met them just at the turn of the corridor. The Nivenes nursed her with devoted attention for weeks. When I last heard from them that she was well enough to go about her duties again, but the doctors say she will always suffer from Hagenbeck heart. Amblecope got up from his chair and moved to another part of the room. Treadleford reopened his book and betook himself once more across. The dragon green, the luminous, the dark, the serpent haunted sea. For a blessed half hour, he disported himself in imagination by the gay Aleppo gate and listened to the bird voice singing man. Then the world of today called him back. A page summoned him to speak with a friend on the telephone. As Treadleford was about to pass out of the room, he encountered Amplecope, also passing out. On his way to the billiard room, where perchance some luckless white might be secured and held fast to listen to the number of his attendances at the Grand Prix, with subsequent remarks on the new market and the Campbell Bridgeshire. Amblecope made it to pass out first, but a newborn pride was surging in Treadleford's breast, and he waved him back. I believe I take precedence, he said coldly. You are merely the club bore. I am the club liar. <laughs>